Testing one, two, three. Testing one, two, three. Hello, everybody. We'll give it just a minute. Allow our amazing partners time to get into class, and then we will begin. Hello, Miss Karen. Hello, friends and family. Hello. Good to have everybody in class today. Hope you're having lots of steak and broccoli. <laughs> Left my props out. Hello, Lynn Eldon. Hello, everybody. We'll give it just a minute, and then we'll get started. Oh, have, are you lucky thing? My mama. Karen, did you, did you know that I'm a mama boy? I guess Casey and I both are. <laughs> I'm definitely a mama boy. Miss my mama. That's a, one of the, the few negatives about living in Florida. I miss my mama. Yes. Many people tease me that I was almost the girl that my mom never had. <laughs> I'm her sense. I'm her sensitive child. <laughs> uh, I don't let her fool you, Karen. She loves to see me come, but she loves to see me go too. I understand. <laughs> yes, I know you do, brother Charles. I know you do. We love to see the youngins come, but we love to see. <laughs> see them go too. Oh. <clears throat> little nose run there hello everybody welcome welcome we're about to get started got a lot to cover today i did not put together a powerpoint i'm sorry but the information will be very valuable uh it just won't look as pretty one of these days, I'm going to have someone do PowerPoints for me. I can keep dreaming. Hey, Patricia. It's good to have Patricia in two classes in a row. Howdy, everybody. Make yourself at home. We want to welcome our partners. We'll get started now. We want to thank our partners, first and foremost. Let us thank our partners. Uh, we really appreciate you becoming a partner, being a special part of our mission. We could not do what we do at the level we do it without you. So thank you so much. I hope you're enjoying uh, the extra time together uh, and being able to really uh, vet out and explore topics that we don't get to uh, as most of our time is relegated to helping new people get, get started and uh, spend the first eight, 12 weeks with them installing a new lifestyle. Uh, but it's, it's always, uh, knowledge is always power. The more we know, the better decisions we'll make. The more we can dispel myths about um, even our topic today, muscle building versus fat loss. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about physique transformation, or you might say muscle building. So this, that is our exclusive partner class today. I am recording. It will go in your partner dashboard. Uh, if you are not a partner, this is an exclusive class for partners. The first partner session is always free. We're not running people out of here. Uh, we rely on the goodwill of our members. We consider ourselves a family. And if you'd like to support our mission and you feel led to do so, uh, you will get to enjoy partner perks. But if God has led you to do so, you can do so at www.helpshaboleth.com. And you can sign up uh, for anywhere between $5 a month. And we've got somebody paying $100 a month. And we appreciate uh, those that contribute based upon the unction the Lord gives them. You truly are saving lives. Uh, and one day we hope to provide even a, a better program. We take every dime we can get and put right back into the program. We take out what we need to keep a roof over our head. Uh, we keep out what we need to have a vehicle. Uh, and that is it. Uh, everything else that we can muster 
goes into paying for our support team because we believe that's the most important part of, of uh, transformation is support. And uh, every dime goes into that and our technology, our website, the app. And the more we're blessed by you all, the more we can do for you all, okay? Uh, so yes, you can sign up, Margaret. You can sign up uh, monthly uh, as, as, for as little as $5 a month. Or you can pay whatever you feel led to pay. So, for example, if you pay $100 at one time and you don't do it monthly, then you get uh, 20 months of exclusive, exclusive partner perks. So we base it upon five bucks. That's how much time you get. So if you are led to do $50, then you get 10 months of partner perks. Uh, so we really appreciate that. Hopefully you'll enjoy today's class. I'll show you the new dashboard, bear with me. We'll get into the topic today, which is physique transformation very shortly, uh, but let me show you where to begin finding partner perks and the upcoming partner perks. We have now put it all in the dashboard. So it's easy to find, you click dashboard and then you go to the partner dashboard, partner tab. And here you will see the features. Sasha's done a fantastic job of laying this out. And this is where we will build all of your exclusive features. Uh, there really are many more to come. You have your partner workouts that we explored last year. And you have your partner deep dive. So I click deep dive. And these are the three classes. Now this is the fourth one. And we'll keep doing these three per month deep dive discussions, at least three per month. And the recording will go here for you to access any time that you need to or want to, okay? Exclusively for you. How do we, in addition to our monthly partnership, give a one-time amount when we're able? You can do that through Help Shibboleth. And what we do is just add time on. Not that you're doing it for the time, but it just as a matter of procedure here, we add time. Uh, we've got we've got a couple of people that's got um, like <laughs> I think it's something like 700 months. <laughs> so obviously they're not doing it for the perks; they're just doing it to be a, of a help. But we give them extra time. Okay, let's get started with our discussion on physique transformation there's a lot to unpack here okay most everybody that we come in contact with come here to lose weight but we're not really talking about that properly when we talk about losing weight what we're really meaning when when we join the program when you join the program is how do we lose fat? How do we lose fat and preserve muscle? That should really be the question. But we live in a culture and country where it's all about the diet mentality, losing weight. When in fact, we do not want to lose muscular weight. Uh, in fact, we do not want to lose uh, tendon, ligament strength. Uh, we do not want to lose the health of our living tissue, our organs. We do not want to uh, weaken our heart muscle while we're losing weight. But in fact, most people that are losing weight uh, through improper dieting, they're actually for real becoming worse off. When most of the weight we lose is muscle and not fat, we actually end up worse because we lose the weight through calorie deficit alone. Most of that weight was muscle and vitality. And then we've lost part of our metabolism. The more your muscle is what's responsible for burning calories at rest. When you hear the term, baseline metabolic rate. That is the number of calories, the units of energy your body burns 
while at rest over a 24 hour period. That number is generated by the amount of muscle on your body. This is why many women falsely say that men lose weight. They do lose weight faster, but they'll say men lose weight faster than women. And there's some truth to that. That's not the entire truth. We can explore that at a later date. But really the reason men lose weight faster is because their metabolism is higher simply because they carry more living tissue mass. So they're burning more calories at rest. The more muscle, the more calories one will burn at rest. So when people diet improperly and they don't know how to eat, they're losing the weight, but most of that weight they're losing is muscle, living tissue, therefore they're diminishing metabolism so that when they come off of that diet and they go back to eating somewhat normal, they gain the weight back so rapidly because they, they, they ended up really worse off depleting the strength of their heart muscle, depleting the strength of other organs because they've been cannibalizing their own living tissue. And then when they gain the weight back, they're at a heavier weight with less heart capacity, et cetera. Does that aspect of what I just said make sense? This is why yo-yo dieting is so counterproductive. It's almost why at times I try, some of y'all have seen me do it, and I try to do it in a loving way. It's why you see me run, try to run people off until they're ready. Y'all ever seen me do that? Sometimes it really wounds people. But I'm doing them a disservice if I let them stay around and constantly yo-yo diet. Because you take someone um, like my good friend Charles who's here. I'm proud of Charles. He's lost 200 pounds and he's being consistent. But Charles and I had a heart-to-heart -heart talk a year and a half ago in that time frame, couldn't keep doing this. And I have other friends in the program can't keep doing this because I feel responsible. Because if I let you yo-yo diet, every time you lose weight, you are losing some heart health. And then if you gain the weight back, it's okay if we're diminishing our heart's capacity some, because as we're losing weight, we're, our heart is not having to work as hard anyway because we're losing the weight. There's less body mass for the heart to have to pump blood flow to, less living tissue. So we get so then once we get to our goal weight, we can shift focus and rebuild ourselves while we remain uh, at a good BMI. But if we are constantly yo-yo dieting, we end up a lot worse than if we would have accepted, hey, we're just going to be big and strong. We're just going to be big and strong. That's better. It'd be better if you lost the body mass and then rebuilt yourself. And today we're going to talk about that very process. But the yo-yo dieting has got to go. And what it takes to build muscle, listen, building muscle is not easy. It's much harder than losing fat. I get those requests daily. How can I modify? I want to build muscle. And then when I look at a person's BMI, they're still over fat. They haven't even, uh, they haven't even cut down enough to start thinking about building muscle. We need to do this in seasons which again, we're gonna talk about today. There's a lot to unpack here and I hope that you'll take notes. We're gonna do some board work, but I hope you'll take notes. The first thing that we need to do when we're thinking about or talking about physique transformation is do an assessment. And this assessment needs to give you at least with some accuracy 
your body fat percentage. Now, the best way to come up with body fat percentage is to go find the most accurate way, but not practical, is to go find uh, one of those hydrostatic water weighing tanks. There is no other device that will give you an accurate body fat percentage beyond a hydrostatic water weighing tank. There are other devices that will give you a general number that you can watch trend lines with. For example, I use this online assessment I'm about to show you, or I use my RIMFO scales, or if I have Sasha's assistance, I use calipers. Outside of hydrostatic water weighing, the next best way to determine body fat percentage is with a set of quality calipers, which we won't be getting into today. I will do a class very soon on how to use calipers. Uh, that is pretty accurate if the administrator knows what they're doing, but it's only as accurate as the one administering the test. I feel that our online assessment or a set of RIMPFO scales is fine if all we're doing is tracking the trend line. If you're not a professional athlete, all you really need is the online assessment and or your RIMPFO scales. Okay, so let's first look at an assessment so you can learn, you can start understanding BMI and, and um, body fat percentage. So I'm gonna go to the website and I'm gonna go in the journal. And then I'm going to go to assessment. I'm gonna put in some numbers that aren't up to date, but are about my situation. I'm 52, <laughs> I'm using the Navy algorithm, I have an Army Navy algorithm. I, I prefer the, the Navy one. So weight, 199.7, height, 75 inches, neck, 16, abdomen, waist. Now here, we're not talking about our pant size. This is not talking about our pant size. This is um, not too snug, not too loose, right around the center of your navel, okay? 35 inches bicep, 15 inches. Uh, this is not a pumped muscle, but just kind of taut. So all of these measurements are the thickest part of the region and not relaxed, but not trying to do a muscular pose, just kind of just kind of normal. Okay. That's the way I do it. Just be consistent every time you do it, and it won't matter. However, you do it, do it consistently the same way. Forearm 12, wrist 7.5. Now, here, let me stop here. Why would we need one of your wrists? In order for the algorithm to work, we have to know about your bone structure. And the wrist is a good indicator. Your wrist against your height, against your gender, gives the algorithm some information to determine if you are an ectomorph, a tiny wrist indicates an ectomorph structure. A mesomorphic structure, this also can, if I were working with you one-on-one, -on -one, okay, if you wanna pay me the big bucks, I'm happy to do that then I would base your personalized nutrition program on whether you are an ectomorph, a mesomorph, or an endomorph. A mesomorph, excuse me, an ectomorph struggles to put on muscular weight. But they also rarely get in a situation where they're obese. Their body, an ectomorph's body, typically deals with carbohydrate extremely well. Then there is the mesomorph. This is the ideal structure. They put on muscle very easily. They drop fat very easily. And counter to everyone here's opinion of themselves, 
most of you will be a classic mesomorph. In fact, I was always told I was an endomorph. They told me in high school, my health education teacher, that I was an endomorphic person, an endomorphic structure. Wrong. I'm a classic mesomorph. Most of us here are. And then there's the endomorph. The endomorph puts on weight very easily. And most of you are like, that's me, but you're not. Uh, an endomorph puts on body fat very easily and also puts on muscle very easily. They have a very big bone structure, big head, big wrist, big fingers, big hands, endomorphs, and they put on weight very easily. You often see an endomorph uh, in the athletic endeavor of a power lifter. So, those are your three types. So when I go back to my assessment and I'm putting in the data, wrist 7.5, hips 38, my thighs about 23 inches, calves 16 inches, boom. So I, I click send and it tells me I have no excess fat. My body fat, according to the assessment, a little lower on the RIMFO scales, but it tells me here that I'm 15.41% uh, body fat. This begins to tell me how to personalize my nutrition. This is a good note-taking moment, by the way. I'm going to get a little ahead of myself since we're here and explain your calorie intake for this, this section. Uh, my lean body weight is 168.92 pounds. I have to support that with protein. If I'm trying to get in protein uh, in order to preserve muscle while losing fat, I need a half a gram up to a gram of protein per day. The Bulletproof Shield will take care of that without much thought. So in other words, I would need about 85 grams of protein a day to preserve my muscle. If I were trying to build muscle, then I have it gets more difficult. Then I really should care about the numbers. The bulletproof shield will not give me enough protein to build muscle. It will only give me enough protein to preserve muscle. If I'm trying to build muscle, I need 168 grams a day and probably more like 330 grams a day, double that if I'm trying to build muscle. As we'll get into in a little bit, you have to give your body more raw material if you're building muscle, you have to have a surplus of protein to build muscle. Essential fat, 11.98 pounds. I don't want to lose much of that. I need that for survival. In fact, when you hear people ask me in class, am I going to starve to death on your program? You're in no danger of starving to death or even going into starvation mode until your excess fat's gone and your reserve fat's gone. When people talk about, I'm starving to death, this program's gonna starve me, it's gonna kill my metabolism, they don't know what they're talking about. Your body has a survival mechanism in it so that once you get down to just the essential fat that you need for survival, the essential fat that gives your joints a cushion, the essential fat that gives you some fuel in, time, uh, in times of starvation, the essential fat uh, that uh, stores the fat soluble vitamins that we need, another reason you should be taking a vitamin every day, um, then your body can go into what the culture calls starvation mode. I doubt there's any of us here in danger of starvation mode. I could fast for days and not get in trouble other than feeling a little faint or lightheaded because I'm not giving my body any glucose. But you can see I still have 18.8 .8 pounds of reserve fat. That means that I've got 18 pounds times 3,500 calories of reserve fuel. So uh, I, I didn't bring my phone with me. But if you do that math, eight, there's 3,500 calories in a pound of fat. 
and that's reserve fuel. And I've got 18 extra pounds of fat reserve fuel. 18 times 3,500, that's a lot of calories. So as long as I was staying hydrated, I could go a long time without eating anything before I went into some sort of starvation mode. Thanks, Sally and Karen. 63,000 calories that I've got in reserve in case of the zombie apocalypse. <laughs> Are y'all as fascinated by this kind of stuff as I am? I just love it. This is so refreshing to me to have people to just talk about this stuff with. And I love talking about the basics, but uh, you know, I need to, I need to be stimulated too sometimes. <laughs> so anyway, we'll get back to it. All right. So we're learning what this stuff means and then we look at body mass index and we look at our baseline metabolic rate if i'm trying to maintain my weight and i am of normal activity not extra activity not sedentary activity but normal activity getting out and getting some exercise three four days a week trying to get ten thousand steps a day my body, my calorie needs to maintain, I always tell people, do your ideal weight times 10 for maintenance. Everybody write that down. Ideal weight, and you'll see baseline metabolic rate. This is telling me, based upon my muscle mass, I need 1,900 calories a day to maintain. And my number's spot on because I need, 200 pounds times 10 is 2,000 calories. So if I stay around 2,000 calories a day with adequate macronutrient profile, then I'm going to do a good job of maintaining my weight. Now, as I age and lose muscle by default, this number will come down, and I'll have to monitor that so that I don't become over fat. Okay. I go down to the bottom and I see two really important charts. My BMI chart, your BMI chart, statistically speaking, is about longevity. Your body fat percentage chart is about appearance. Ideally, I want to be in a good range in both charts. But if you got to pick one chart, the BMI chart is the more important one for your longevity. Your body fat percentage chart, the more important ch uh, chart for vanity. <laughs> Does that make sense what I'm saying there? This is longevity versus vanity. I want a healthy dose of both. As you can see, my BMI is solid. I'm on the high end of the approved BMI. It is just as challenging on your immune system and your longevity to be overly muscular as it is overly fat. That doesn't get talked about very much. Now, if I was going to be one or the other, over fat or over muscular, I'd definitely take my chances on the over muscular side but I really want to maintain a decent body fat percentage and a decent BMI. So my body mass index, I still have work to do because I'm on the high side, but I started at over 40 on the BMI scale. So I've made considerable, done considerable work. You have too. Body fat percentage, this is about the vanity. You know, do you want those abs? So here I'm in the zero drag range. I've been as low as an athletic range. I've never made it to, to the, and I don't want to. Uh, a man that's two to 6% body fat or a woman that's 10 to 14% body fat, they may look lean and ripped and fit, but this is a little dangerous. In my estimation, our ladies should strive for zero drag body fat percentage. We, we call it zero drag. That means 
nothing, zero, there's nothing dragging you down or back anymore. You have arrived. Men, I think, should strive for 14 to 18% body fat. And of course, if you want to dial in and be athlete, be an athlete, boom, you can do that. But the, the older we get, the less we should be striving for an athletic body fat percentage. In fact, the older we get, I think the approved zone is best. I really do. So a lady that's anywhere from 21 to 32% body fat, she's in a pretty decent range as long as she's happy with herself. Okay, when I started, I was 44% body fat. Okay, this tells us a lot about where we go next. When we're starting physique transformation, some people say I want to build muscle. I think it's important to understand that you cannot, this is a bell moment. You cannot, cannot, and I emphasize, impossible to gain muscle and lose fat at the same time. We need to do this in what I refer to personally as seasons. And this actually, I think, makes the program more fun um, because there's seasons of change. My marker's not working too good here. I don't even know if y'all can see that. Let me try something else here. Why are my markers not working? Seasons, seasons. So when we're talking about physique transformation and someone says, Travis, I wanna put on muscle and lose fat, you can't do that. You've gotta do one or the other. You've got to decide if you want to preserve muscle and lose fat or if you want to put on muscle and bulk up. So it's seasons. You have in your journey, you have a cutting season. You have a maintenance season. And you have a building season. Instead of bulking, we'll call it a building season. Every, almost to my knowledge, and there may be someone here that has already moved to it, it's time for a different season. But everybody under the sound of my voice, I think, and I'm pretty sure you should still be in a cutting season. You should not consider a building season until you've gotten rid of all of your excess fat. To build muscle requires a different eating strategy than cutting fat. You cannot do both at the same time with this exception. There is an exception. Let's talk fat cells for a moment. I think that's the best way to back into this discussion. So I was over 300 pounds. Okay. I was born predisposed genetically. I was born based upon that predisposition, genetic predisposition, with a certain amount of fat cells. Millions, right? As I grew and eat, ate improperly, I filled those available fat cells and my body had to produce more. Let me try to explain it this way. How many of you, if you really pay attention to your history, your, your back journey, there were times that you put on weight fast and then there were times you didn't change your eating. You were always eating improperly, whether you knew how to eat right or not but you had a lifestyle, a way of eating, and there would be times it seemed like you put on 10 pounds overnight, 
and then the weight gain would slow down. It wasn't like a, a consistent line upward. It was like, boom, you woke up one day and you were up five pounds. Boom, you woke up one day and you were up 10 pounds. So the reason that happens that way perceptively is that once you feel all of your available fat cells, insulin, you're provoking insulin, insulin's pushing, converting to fat, the, 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 uh, the surplus of calories converts to fat, insulin's driving it into the cell, and all your cells are full, okay? And you keep overeating, not knowing you're doing it or not, you know, whether you know or not, doesn't matter, but you kept doing it. And then your body goes, I ain't got nowhere to put this. Like, exactly, Sally said, it's like you skip clothing sizes, right? Your body doesn't have anywhere to put it. So your body has to now go through the process of creating more fat cells for more fat storage. So your body creates more fat cells. And then you fill those up. And the weight went up, boom. You skip the pant size. You skip the dress size. What happened? Then you go through a season again. You keep doing it, and your body creates more fat cells. Now, once you decide to lose fat and you go about that the right way, you are not getting rid of the fat cells. They are still there. But you're able to shrink them and minimize them through using the energy that's trapped there. Is this making sense? So then you lose weight. So Charles and myself, if Charles and I go off of our eating lifestyle and go back to overindulging, when I put on my first 100 pounds, it took years. But now I could put on that 100 pounds seemingly overnight. I could put it back on in two months. Charles will back me up there. He's done that. I've done that. I put on weight so fast, it's mind boggling. So I must stick to a proper eating lifestyle if I want to have any hope of keeping that excess weight off because all those fat cells up to my high weight. Now, I could balloon back up to my high weight and then there would be some time where it'd be hard to put on weight but my body would make room for me to put on more weight. My lifestyle is so important. The same thing works with muscle. So you can lose fat and put on muscle at the same time. But it's relevant to the uh, uh, maximum amount of muscle that you've ever, ca ever carried. So, for example, you start Shibboleth and you're doing it the right way. And you also decide to start exercising. You're in a calorie deficit, but you're exercising. The old muscle that was there that used to be there when you were an athlete in high school or a cheerleader in high school, here's the good news. It's still there. Those muscle cells are still there. They're still there. And if you're getting adequate protein, it's real easy for those muscular cells to reconstitute even while you're in a calorie deficit. But you can only do that, lose fat and put on muscle up to the point whereby you've been top line muscular before. Does, does that make sense? But now, if in my lifetime I've carried more muscle than I'm carrying now, I can get back there without extra calories. But once I get, which I am right now, I'm in the, not that I'm muscular, but I'm in the most muscular uh, phase that I've ever been in. I've never carried more muscle in my lifetime than I carry today. So, I can't really build additional muscle without a surplus of calories, specifically protein. Does this part of our discussion make sense to you? 
as to why we have to do this in seasons and that we should not begin to think about building strength or muscle until we cut all the excess fat. Unless you're like a friend of mine who wants to be a power lifter. He is uninterested in the vanity like I am. He's uninterested in having an abdominal muscle show. He wants to be as strong as he can possibly be. So he's wanting to bypass the cutting phase and start the building phase. That's fine. The only way to build new muscle or new fat or reconstitute new fat is to eat a surplus of the right calories. Now, if you eat a surplus of, of bad calories, empty calories, you get fat real fast and not muscle. You cannot put on extra muscle without extra protein. I'll give you another thing to think about. How many of you have noticed that when you violate the portion component, but you violate the portion component with approved foods, you put on weight slower than if you violate the portion component with unapproved foods. Has anybody noticed that? If you haven't, it may be it's just never been brought to your attention. Example, my mama taught me how to make spaghetti like I like it. But if I make it with Mueller's white pasta, and fatty ground beef, and I overindulge in it, I put on weight a lot faster. If I overindulge in approved pasta and lean meat, even though I'm overindulging, I put on the weight much slower. Why? Because I'm controlling insulin better. And insulin maximizes your body's ability to store surplus. In fact, when you go into a building phase, we don't want you spending time in the red column or yellow column. We want you to spend all of your time in the blue column because we need that insulin. That insulin is a growth hormone. Let's look at some body types. Sorry that these aren't the best ones. I kind of got in a hurry. <laughs> so here, I'm going to show you some ladies. I'm going to show you some men, not the best examples, but it's good to talk about because you may not know, you may not understand. You have three pictures here, three photos. Here you have probably the world's greatest power lifter, Brian Shaw. Here you have a natural physique competitor named Chris Bumstead. And here you have everybody's favorite superhero, Deadpool, Ryan Reynolds, here. So out of these three men, Brian Shaw has the highest body fat percentage but he also is the strongest and he also carries the most muscle. He's eating a ton of surplus calories because if he don't, he won't be very good at his chosen profession. Muscle is strong. We need more muscle to get stronger. But unfortunately, when we put on more muscle, we also by default add more fat. Brian Shaw is staying in most of the time a building or maintenance phase, never a cutting phase. Chris Bumstead has the hardest job because he has to do this in seasons. He has to go through probably a 12 week cutting season and then an off season where he's building. 
And during the off season, he will be putting on fat. But what he does is put on the muscle through proper nutrition and working out. And as he's putting on muscle and putting on fat, then he, once he puts on the muscle that he needs to put on, he begins to preserve the muscle and cut the fat so that one could see the muscle he's built that lay up under the fat. Both of these situations are not doable for most of us. The amount of work that this takes is insane. So when people say, you know, I want to have this middle physique, you better know what you're talking about because it will be your life 24 seven. But you look at Ryan Reynolds down here. Okay, and by the way, drugs is a, a major part of a lot of these transformations that people want. We need a more reasonable, ideal image for ourselves. Ryan Reynolds. Here, most of the men that come into our program had preferred to look like this guy down here. How many of you, it's mostly ladies here, but when I showed those images, how many, how many of you ladies prefer the physique of the guy down here over these other two? This is good news I have for everybody. How many of you actually prefer the one on the bottom? <laughs> Karen doesn't like any of those. So, and I had to give you some exaggerated examples to make points. But the one on the bottom, this is how most men look if they just get rid of the fat. This, this was not a lot of work. They just got rid of the fat. You say, Travis, I don't have those abs under my fat. Yes, you do. They're there. Let's take a look at the ladies. So the strongest of these ladies here is this lady here that's the power lifter. She has quite a bit of fat, but it's because she wanted to build. She wanted to build muscle. But underneath any fat that she has lay a lot of muscle, okay? Both of these ladies, they build in. And this one's taking drugs, <laughs> insulin being one of those drugs. But then we come down here and we look at physiques. The first two here are, are ladies that have made their life about working out and fitness. They have to do what that guy in the middle I showed you, they have to go through seasons of change. This one here and this one here. Seasons of change. They have to go through cutting phases and building phases like it's their job. And this is what I get asked about all the time. Like, you don't really want to do what you say you want to do. Now we look at two ladies. We've got a lady here, Jennifer Garner, that's in her 40s. And Helen Mirren, which is almost 80 years old now. I think this picture was taken of Helen when she was about 70. They've dedicated themselves to activity, but they basically stay in a cutting and maintenance season all the time. Now, I don't know about you all, but as a man, I find Helen Mirren extremely fit and attractive. To me, most of my clients, they don't think that they could achieve this, but they can if they just preserve the muscle and cut the fat. I guess better, say, better said is that these two ladies, especially Helen Mirren, they're not exercising that much. They're just staying toned and they're cutting the excess fat. I don't know about y'all, but if I were a woman, I'd love to be in my 70s and as fit as Helen Mirren. But it's all about your situation. It's all about your goals. We teach here 
situational nutrition. It's based upon your goal and your situation. Okay. Now, going back to cutting, maintenance, and building. Are there any questions before we get into modifying nutrition for maintenance and building? Are there any questions about when you should move from a cutting season to a maintenance or building season? Or do you all get that now? And by the way, if you're in a cutting season, you follow the Shibola shield. You make sure that you take in adequate protein. You make sure that you manage carbohydrate tightly. Carbohydrate is energy carbs. And if you don't use that energy, it is converted to fat and easily stored as fat. You do not want a surplus of carbohydrate. The way to go about this is to stay mostly with your red and yellow columns and eat the blue column combinations very sparingly and stay away from carbohydrate. It's not mandatory, but I'm just saying, stay away from even good carbohydrate after 4 p.m. When you're cutting, you want to try your best to stay at your ideal weight times eight. So my ideal weight was 200 pounds. So I want to stay around in order to keep cutting and preserving muscle. I want to stay around 200 times eight. That puts me at a top line of 1600 calories. Now, if I'm getting those 1600 calories from mostly red and yellow column, I'm going to preserve muscle and I'm going to burn fat. How do I know I'm preserving muscle? Because I'm doing the two primary things that allow me to preserve muscle and not lose very much muscle. Number one, I'm getting adequate protein. Going back to our illustration earlier, I have lean body weight of roughly 170 pounds. I need to get a half a gram up to one gram of protein per pound of lean body weight, which means I need to be between 85 and 170 grams of protein a day. The only time I'm worried about this is when I'm on a one or two meal eating strategy. In this case, I fortify and add extra protein. The only time on a perfect day that I eat a larger portion than this is when I'm only having that meal or I'm having two meals. Then I may add a bowl of high protein soup to my meal, or I may fortify with a pure protein supplement like Beverly UMP. But again, I stress only when I'm not getting in three eating episodes. That ensures that I preserve a maximum amount of muscle. While I'm losing fat, I will lose weight slower, but most of the weight I lose will be fat. Number two, the life and the health of the flesh is in the blood. So I need to use it or I'll lose it. Does that make sense? If I'm in a calorie deficit, I'm in danger of losing more muscle than I want to lose. But if I don't want to lose muscle, doing one or both of these ensure that most all of my loss is fat. And then as the fat drops, I'm uncovering muscle. Now, how can I shape that muscle? How can I tone that muscle? Here's another big myth. In order to shape and tone muscle and for it to be beautiful, I need to lift weights. Wrong, wrong. When you're in a cutting phase, now I know I've been talking and sometimes I can lull people to sleep with my voice. Are y'all still with me? 
Are you awake? I don't want you to miss the good stuff. All right. So in my situation, in your situation, where our primary goal is to cut and preserve muscle, it's not weights uh, uh, that we need. That looks great. But all that stuff does you very little good. If you're going to stay, if you're not going to be one of those bodybuilders and you want to look amazing like Helen Mirren or me, like Ryan Reynolds, right? Here's what you need to do. Okay. We need to be doing the following to keep the fat off and to keep our lower extremities toned and fit. Believe it or not, walk. Well, Walk. Walking, you don't hear it talked about much because it's free. Ain't nothing you got to buy unless you want a Fitbit or a tracker. Walking is brisk walking. I'm not talking about snail's pace. I mean getting after it. Getting after it. Walking is the best if you could only choose one exercise. It's not even up for debate. The best exercise for muscle preservation, for fat loss, for your mental health is brisk walking. Brisk walking. On flat land, on hills, up and down hills, brisk walking to the point that you get your heart rate up to the target rate and leave it there for 20 minutes to an hour. Nothing like it. If you're already in a calorie deficit, you have limited time, look, you get to walk. It's not I have to walk, you get to walk. You get to do you get to, and you can multitask when you walk. You can listen to beautiful music, motivational music, Christian music, listen to audio books, educate yourself, talk to the Bible. There's nothing like brisk walking and keeping your heart in the target zone for efficient fat loss while following Shabbat. Now, that is 220 minus your age, okay? So, for, for example, 220 minus my age, I'm 52. So, I come up with 168. Does everybody see how I did that? How I come up with 168? Then I take that number, 168 times 0 0.70. And I got 118, okay? That number times 0.70 is 118. Now, my target heart rate while following Shibola and being in a cutting phase is 108 to 128. 10 below that number and 10 above that number. If I can keep my heart rate here for 20 minutes to an hour a day, my fit level, including my cognitive ability, go through the roof. If we would watch our processed food intake, watch our sugar and starch intake, and we would walk daily and consistently and fast 16 hours a day, you'd almost never hear about Alzheimer's or dementia. Fact. 
back. So if we have limited time, rather than lift weights, we want to walk, okay? Next, body weight exercises. Now, as a partner, we've put you together the best body weight exercises. So body weight, we'll call it BWE, body weight exercises. Now, when we're in a cutting phase and we're trying to preserve muscle, why do we need to lift weights if we can't even handle our own body weight? Why don't you hear about this more? Again, it doesn't cost anything. You have your body with you. Has anybody did any of the partner exercises and actually done it for more than three or four days in a row? Anybody yet? You may not have anybody done it yet. Karen did it. Sally did it. Were you amazed at how quickly you were getting stronger? You were getting stronger because you were reconstituting muscle that was laying there dormant that was saying, please help me come back to life. You had a resurrection. Now, what if we remain consistent with that the rest of our days? Okay. All you need to get in the best condition of your life is proper nutrition. This group, cutting phase or maintenance phase. Walking and body weight exercises. And you would literally, in no time, look like someone who was lifting weights, extremely disciplined, et cetera. This is the way forward, is incorporating your daily disciplines, then pre this is the new thing I'm gonna use, okay? Incorporating your daily disciplines, Shibola Shield, then hitting your turbo button, which we've been talking about a lot, and then include walking. And if time allows, body weight exercises. We want to buy all these apparatuses. We want to pump the iron. You don't need it. Now, if you ever decide that you want to go into the muscle building phase and build more muscle, which, let me take you back, Remember what I said about BMI? Did you know that during the height of the COVID pandemic, that statistically speaking, there were more people that died from that deadly disease, that virus, more people died that were overly muscular than did that were overly fat? Did you know that? Bodybuilders, by the way, professional bodybuilders have one of the highest mortality rates in our country. They're sacrificing health for their, their love of their profession or for vanity reasons. And a lot of it has to do with their drug intake too, but too much muscle is as bad as too much fat. So for me, I feel that I need to stay in the cutting and maintenance mode. So when I get to maintenance, and I'm in maintenance now 50% of the time, I have a line in the sand. If I put on too much weight, 10 pounds too much, I drop it like it's hot. So it's like I'm always back and forth. I don't want to get too skinny, look like a sick catfish. So maintenance. I spend about half my time in maintenance now. For me, when I'm maintaining, I don't need to stay below 200 times eight. I need to stay at my ideal weight times 10. If you do want to build, you need to stay at your the number you want to build to. Let's say that your ideal weight is 240 pounds you want to put on 40 pounds, then you would do 240 times 12. And that would be your target goal for calories. But I don't even know that we need to talk about this. 
unless you're asking for your son who's already a juggernaut and just wants to put on a lot of muscle. Again, it's just a, it's, it's a misconception, a misprioritization. Most of us will forever be moving now between cutting and maintenance. And we have simplified that. All we got to do is follow the Shibola shield. All right. I know we're about out of time and I went on and on and on. Any questions? And I'm going to look for some of your questions now. My mom says, is there a point in partner exercise that you reach max reps? Yeah, when you go through one round uh, and you've increased your reps, what we do is increase the intensity of the exercise. In other words, we, make, we start over and we make it more difficult. So give you an example. When I went through one round of push-ups and I maxed out and did as many as I could and it got to where I was having to do so many, when I started over, I added a weighted vest. And then I did max reps again based upon the amount of weight that was in my weighted vest. And then it was like starting all over because I actually added weight. You can make each exercise more intense so you're not doing hundreds and hundreds of reps. Herschel Walker does thousands of reps a day because all he does is body weight stuff, but he dedicates hours to getting all those reps in. We can fix that by simply adding weight to that, that exercise. And when someone gets there, we can discuss that. I like to see people rather than, especially in our age groups here, our target audience, I prefer rather than you squatting a barbell after you master body weight squats, I prefer most of our folks use a weighted vest or some hand weights to increase the intensity of that exercise. Katie, thanks for asking. Again, I've got to eat crow. The pirate ship did not arrive. Uh, I'm sorry. I promise, though, the start date is February the 6th. We've got plenty of time. And they're trying to nail down a feature called the treasure hunt. And uh, probably will be ready, but we don't want to take any chances. So now we're looking at Monday. I still will go live tonight with a, a brief huddle up, hopefully to do my best to keep people motivated but I need to give my team a little more time to get that done. They, you know, it's not their fault, small team, and we had to have updates on the code and all kinds of things that had to be priority for the privacy and safety of our members. So it's just things got in the way again, but it looks like Monday uh, is gonna be the day for uh, the Jack orientation. Lee, maintenance is ideal weight times 10. Now these are roundabout numbers because I'm not there to do a caliper, uh, you know, a body, uh, to do a, a caliper test with you to tell you specifically. These are roundabout numbers that work. Maintenance is ideal weight times 10. You should stay below that number. Where does these calories come from? Red column, yellow column, the occasional blue column. Do I increase protein? Just stick with the Shibola shield unless you're only getting one to two eating episodes a day. Then you might want to fortify with a serving of protein. Question about hemp bars. I've noticed that it is recommended to eat those before 4 p.m. It is the chocolate for for that suggestion, it is the sugar that's uh, in the chocolate, yes. We don't want to have, uh, we don't want to elevate blood sugar because that causes insulin load before bedtime. You can do it. You can have a third of a hemp bar as a meal replacement in the evening and you'll probably get great results, but it's just optimal to avoid carbs at night. Optimal, not mandatory. Yeah, uh, I have invested heavily, Ruth, in my home gym, and it's gold to me. 
some of the best investments I've ever made. I did it piece by piece, and now it's mine forever. I've got a, a weight rack, it's called a power rack. I've got a rower, and I have got a um, treadmill and a recumbent bike. And I've got everything in my gym that I need so that I don't have any excuses. It took time to build my gym, but it's one of the best investments I've made. Correct. If, if you're trying to maintain Lee and you're exercising, you might want to add additional food. Now, here's a great debate, though. I do not prefer going over three eating episodes. I do not want to graze. Even if I look like Dwayne The Rock Johnson, I do not believe in grazing. I do not believe it's healthy at all. Even for those that look amazingly fit, I am not a subscriber to eating many meals a day. Now, once you get into maintenance, if you want the extra calories because you're working out so hard and you need the energy for your gym workout and you're not worried about losing anymore, then just make sure that you eat that food in an eating window. So a 16-hour fast every day takes care of that concern of mine where people go back to grazing. If you're going to graze, do it within the context of a 16 hour fast. And then I don't think it's that big of a problem. You need to give your digestive system a break every day. Does it include fibrous carbs? Avoid fibrous carbs at night. It does not. Again, we start getting into that knickknack mindset. My mom knows what I'm talking about. She and I both are knickknackers. It works against us. So we are allowed fibrous carbohydrate freebies if we're having a moment of mental weakness. But what I advise people to do is even as it regards freebies, get in the habit of a 16-hour fast. You're not there yet mentally, maybe. So then start with a 12 hour fast. Fibrous carbs after 4 p.m. are not gonna cause us a problem as long as they're within the context of our program. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm a, I love to knickknack. And if I'm gonna knickknack, I'm gonna be okay if I knickknack on cucumbers. But I still want to get in my 16 hour fast every day, minimum of 12 hours. Any, any other beautiful people have beautiful questions. And I've got topics lined up for when y'all don't have topics, but I wanna please, are there other, Karen Klein, anyone? What would y'all like to see upcoming for partners? or I'll give you what I want you to have. <laughs> Did everybody get something out of this? Did it scratch an itch? Question, so do you recommend having the biggest meal of the day as breakfast or lunch? If you are talking about purely out of uh, what is best, what is optimal, it would be optimal for your eating window to be 12 to four o'clock. Maybe we should do a challenge like this for y'all to see how much better you feel. If you're eating, if you have a normal schedule, your eating window 12 to four would be the most optimal way forward. With a 20 hour fast, 12 to four eating window, eating approved foods, try it for a day. You'll be shocked. Now, Diane, I don't think that's the best because it sets most people up for failure. It sets most people up for failure. 
Alice, to answer your question, if I were looking for optimal, if I ate my first eating episode, let's say I got up, I got up this morning at 4 a.m. If I had my cup of coffee and then had approved beverages to tide me over, some happy juice, whatever, and then I ate my first eating episode at 12, still portion control. And then let's say at two o'clock, I wanted a snack and I had, um, I had some health smart peanut butter patties. And then at four o'clock, I had some Travis spaghetti. How many eating episodes is that everybody? That's three. I could do one, but then I'd need to add protein, add extra portion. I could do two, but I could do three in four hours in that scenario. And then if I stopped eating and I did that for six weeks, I would experience the greatest health and vitality of my life. This is how the body is supposed to operate. Now, is that the right approach for me? It's the optimal approach, but I'm not sure that I could do it. So what happens, I couldn't make a life out of it. What happens when I ate at 12? Here's what happens to people. We have to be realistic. Shibboleth is a what you will do is better than what you won't do. So what would happen, because it's happened to me, if I had that light meal at 12, a snack, and then I had my dinner at four. Sasha comes in from the office, and at eight o'clock, she's made unstuffed cabbage rolls. Is it likely that I'm going to eat? It's likely that I'm going to eat with her. So I prefer my personal strategies based upon my life and my lifestyle. So I prefer to have my first, I prefer to get up, have a cup of coffee, have a happy juice, have a spark, eat my lunch after my 11 o'clock class, not eat anything else until about seven o'clock. And then I eat that and then I'm done. That's not optimal, but it works for me because it's what I'll do. I hope that makes sense. What about the time between meals? You wouldn't be eating. So Alice, if your eating window was say 12 to six, then we would want two to three eating episodes in that time frame. Between 6 p.m. and to 12 the next day, we would want only zero calorie substances or near zero calorie substances. Water would be ideal. There's always good, better, best. I think too often we throw the baby out with the bath water. So I say, here's what's optimal. And then folks go, I can't do it, it's too hard. So sometimes good is good, right? Don't, don't let, you know, we've heard the statement, don't let, Good be the enemy of great. Well, don't let great be the enemy of good. Just because you can't do the most optimal, don't do you can't find a path that works for you that's still with, under the umbrella of wellness. What we will do is better than what we won't do. You know, you see every year people join a gym, start a nutrition program, work in got a gazillion things going on they try to do it all and then they give in and, and give up and can't do it sometimes it's better to take a step back and focus on what you can and, and will do and you have to prioritize the number one priority is nutrition you can't exercise enough to overcome a bad diet you're welcome Karen April, I currently fast for 16 to 18 hours. I would like to narrow that down and I'm thinking of replacing one of my two meals with a snack instead of a true meal. The thought process is to have my body get used to less and get down to one meal. 
Would you say that's a good plan or not? As long as once you see that you can consistently stay with one meal, you're weaning yourself off of eating episodes. I think it's brilliant. Once you get to where you believe you can do it, we need to talk about adding raw material to that meal. I hate to sound so technical, but we want to eat fattier foods uh, like steak. Uh, we want to eat more foods that are dense in calories because you're only getting a one, one meal a day. For me, that looks like uh, if I was a steak eater, it would be steak, but I'm not a steak eater. It would, it would look like fish cooked in ghee instead of MCT to add additional calories. Uh, it would look like that fish and ghee, uh, some lima beans and okra, and a bowl of high protein soup at one time to make sure I got in all of the vital nutrition I need. So once you're sure that you can habitually do that and you aren't binge eating because you were trying to do one meal a day, then we can increase what that one robust meal looks like. That's what I hope myself to arrive to, but I'm not quite there. There are days that I just feel like I need something before dinner. And to Diane's point, would we be better to eat one huge breakfast and nothing else? Your health would probably be much better, but it's just not something most of us can do because it's not our culture. And I don't even know, that's not even what hunter gatherers did. You know, they basically left the cave and uh, they went and slayed their meat and and then they ate it, you know, probably once every three days. So, you know, that's uh, what's ideal for human health uh, is not really practical in our culture. Paulette, that's a good idea. We might add that one to the repertoire soon. One, one meal a day strategy. Okay, everybody, that's about all I got to give you today. I hope there were some takeaways. If this was your first partner class, you're welcome to be here in the first one. This is my way of honoring our partners who are helping us fulfill our mission. Uh, so uh, please, if you wanna keep coming to the partner classes on the honor system, www.helpshaboleth.com, www.helpshaboleth.com and you too can become a partner. Awesome. Good to have y'all, and we will reconnect with those of you that have time tonight uh, for a little impromptu around the eight-ish hour. All right, bye everybody, have a good one.